Hello, everyone in the percussion world. You're looking at episode eight of At Percussion. I'm your host, Casey Cangelosi, and today is September 6, 2015. With me today are my buddies, Megan Arns. Hello. Laurel Black. Hi. And Ben Charles. Hi, everybody. So our guest today, named a one-woman dynamo by the Boston Globe, Maria Finkelmeyer is a percussion performer, educator, and active arts entrepreneur. She is the founder of Cadence Arts, and prior to rooting in New England, Maria spent three years as an artist in residence in northern Sweden at the PTO Institute for Music and Media. Hey, Maria. Hello. Hey, so I have a quick personal note about Maria. If any of you know my piece, Plato's Cave, which was commissioned by her and Jacob Remington while they were studying in Sweden, um, it's not notated player one, player two, but it's Jacob and Maria. So if you are familiar with that piece, this is Maria. Surprise! <laughs> <laughs> so, and, and, and Maria, where are you right now? Uh, right now I'm in my home studio in Boston, and it's where I've lived for the past few years, and um, enjoying a nice, beautiful day, and really excited to be here. Thanks for having me. You're, you're very welcome. Your room is very colorful. That's probably the most attractive looking room in Boston I've ever seen. You might have the nicest room. Is that well, right? Thank you. I will thank my landlord for choosing this pale yellow. Uh, don't really have a, a choice, but it's uh, quite cluttered. I try to make the background look as cool and that I know what I'm doing as possible. But if you see behind the screen, there's piles of crap. Hey, so you might have you might have just offended every single friend you have in Boston. It's true. <laughs> yeah, Ben, I don't have any more friends in Boston. Sorry, Brian, <laughs> your room's not as good as Maria's. Yeah, nice. Take that, Brian. <laughs> no, all the, no, all the bricks broken. There's pipes everywhere. It's like, all, yeah, it's the floors are slanted. A little slanted. Yeah. Yeah, they're all slanted, and it costs $900 for a closet. Um, Brian yeah. did have a nice colored room, though, didn't he? I think he had a nice color, too. You know, I think we, um, yeah. we, we kind of overcompensate with the color choices. Like, every room in our house, there's, like, green room and the blue room, and this is, like, the yellow room, and we try to hide the, the, the drywall that's breaking with bright <laughs> colors. But, yeah, it works. <laughs> Hey Maria, since uh, since since I mentioned our piece, mm -hmm. and I know that, that was many many years ago, but can you give us you know any highlights from between then and now? I know that's a long time, but yeah. just just to give everyone a little background, can you tell us a little bit about what you've been what you've been up to, what you've been doing that I I didn't include in your your little intro? Sure. Um... A lot of people do have questions about Sweden, so I'll start there. Um, after graduate school, I studied with Anders Ostrand over in Sweden, and I actually lived in Piteå, which is really close to the Arctic Circle, um, so very, very north, which means long winters and um, very bright and wonderful summers. And over there, I started uh, with a Friends of mine, Jacob Remington and Charles Martin, we just started an ensemble named Ensemble Evolution. We did a lot of fun projects over there. We played under tree houses. We celebrated the Midnight Sun through music. We hosted a festival and invited Casey over, which was when we first actually met in person, which was really fun. Um, and then after about three years there, I decided to move back to America and um, got a job at New England Conservatory in their entrepreneurial musicianship department. So I've been working there for the past few years, and while I've been here in Boston trying to cultivate relationships with musicians and artists here, um, playing in different festivals, working with some visual artists, um, and then just recently founded my own nonprofit called Cadence Arts, and the, the mission of that nonprofit is to incubate new projects, uh, produce large-scale works, and also create new educational initiatives, all driven by percussion and technology. Wow, and and how how new is Cadence Arts? Because I I know you're doing the the Boston and Open Spaces. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I even attended one of those. How yeah. new is Cadence Arts? So I've been trying to kind of figure out what I wanted in an organization for a few years. So I started kind of branding the name and thinking about people I'd like to work with, probably for about two years. Um, and I've 
done these things outdoors with symbols and played at different festivals and started these like kind of one-off workshops but it's really in the past six months that things have started to take off um, I met with a lawyer we did a lot of paperwork uh, made a lot of things official and also found some partnering organizations and partnering um, colleagues that really kind of want to jump on board and make it an an organization um, and a large part of creating nonprofit is also cultivating board members so that's where I am right now and the board members are the team of people that help you make decisions help you raise money um, and kind of differentiate you from a for-profit organization can you can you just tell us what like what is your what, what, what's your goal with Cadence Cadence Arts? Because I've heard of people starting organizations, starting nonprofits, mm -hmm. and, and sometimes I just I wonder like, is it because they they want opportunities to perform, or is it because they're trying to provide a service? I, I, I guess it's probably a, a mix of both, but I don't I don't know. Is there something you can describe with that? Absolutely. So I think. Um, when I kind of went into the professional realm, the professional world, I really saw myself starting an ensemble and saw myself like, you know, here are my really close colleagues. We're going to be a group. We're going to go out and, you know, perform at different venues. We're going to do these educational um, endeavors. But went to Sweden, started something there, which was very temporary, and we all knew that. And when I came to Boston, I realized that um, I didn't have the network ready to create an ensemble, right? In order to create an ensemble, you need people that have the same vision, the same kind of schedules that they can come together and work, often the same background in education, because I think that's really important if you can come from the same network, the same schooling. Um, and I found that I, I don't have the assets for that right now. So what do I have the assets for? And I had a lot of vision and a lot of ideas and amazing colleagues here. Just none of us had the time to really come together and be something. So I said, what if I created an organization that's a little bit more fluid? That if a certain amount of people want to come together and do a big performance, we can provide the infrastructure to make that happen. What if I create some um, one-off partnerships that we can create educational events and so I, I, I saw it as a kind of an incubator system that we can bring in a lot of different people um, to meet the goals of as many people as possible so not just me not just one ensemble but a lot of different creatives coming together so it's a bit of a new model and that's why it's been so hard to kind of get off the ground because every day I wake up and I'm like oh what about this way what if I went structured it this way um, so I'm really excited in the past six months I've met a few people that have had some buy-in um, we had we started a program with this bus called the beat bus with another nonprofit and that's really helped me understand what a really strong partnership looks like and what I really uh, what you need in a partnership to make things happen. So um, I see it as, again, this kind of more fluid incubator organization than just one ensemble that's led by, you know, three to five people. But I'm just kind of the, the bringer together. That's a very yeah. official way to put it. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah beautiful. Hey, um, Ben, do you want to do your historical segment? Yes, I would love to. So um, I knew that Maria had studied in Sweden. I've actually, I've never met Maria in person, but I've met many people that are friends with Maria. We have a lot of mutual friends. Of course. So I thought, I, I, I was thinking about what I wanted to talk with about Sweden, and the first thing that popped into my mind was meatballs, but I didn't think I could do a percussion <laughs> segment about meatballs. And then... Oh, we totally was, could. Oh, man. <laughs> I tried. All right. Uh, <laughs> That's Next my, was Ikea. That's my joke, I actually though. have a friend that has written a piece for me that I'm working on this fall with my percussion ensemble here about getting lost in Ikea, but that doesn't have any historical con. Sorry. We'll talk about that later. Oh, no. It's Ben's turn to be to be frozen. Here, historical I'll entertain you guys with oh, this. You guys, so when I was researching for another topic, I read about something called the Ikea effect, which has actually been researched by people at Harvard and Yale. Um... Dude, no Which doubt. I is. Sorry, Ben, I started talking because no, you got worry. frozen. It's probably better than that. It wasn't me that got frozen. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, that people actually think that their IKEA furniture that they bought and put together themselves, even if they don't do it well, is more valuable than like furniture handmade by some professional. And they've called it the IKEA effect. Wow. Huh. Ben, can you really tell us about that piece though? I'm curious. Yeah, me too. <laughs> 
I just thought... got it like a, a week ago. It was by David Pagel, who Laurel is actually also friends with. Oh, I know, um, yeah. Yeah, it's for solo marimba and four percussionists. Nice. Um, and I'm, pl- I'm playing the solo marimba part. Um, it's kind of, I, I worked up my two mallet technique a lot when I played Prism Rhapsody by Keiko Abe. So I wanted another kind of fast two mallet piece. So there's a lot of fast two mallet licks in it. Um, yeah, and with four percussionists. So nice. that's the piece. Cool. Um, I thought for sure when you I said the you. Ikea effect, you were going to talk about how they make you go through the whole right. thing before you can get to the... Like, oh, the torture that you have to... Yeah, did yeah. you guys... Did you know... This is, we're just doing a whole episode on Ikea. Effects now. <laughs> did you know that Ikea uses 1% of all the wood produced in the world annually? Like 1% wow. of all the wood, wow. wood in the world goes to Ikea furniture. Huh. Wow. Huh. Wow. I thought yeah. that was marimbas. I know. <laughs> <laughs> but there actually are restrictions on rosewood. You can only use rosewood for certain things, including musical instruments and, I think, caskets and furniture. Anyway, we're not talking about that today. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Way off topic already. Today, we are going to be talking about Krumata Percussion Ensemble, which is a very famous historical Swedish percussion ensemble. Um, it's kind of, I would call them the Swedish equivalent of Nexus. Um, so they were founded in 1978 in Stockholm, Sweden um, by Martin Steisner. I'm so terrified of these Swedish names. Martin <laughs> Steisner, Ingvar Halgren, Jan or Jan Halgren, I'm not Jan. sure, and Anders Jan. Holdar. Um, the first three of those went together at the Royal University College of Music, which was at the time known as the State Academy of Music. Um, so uh, just like Nexus, just like Amadinda, these people started by going to school together. Then later on, they formed their own professional ensemble. Um, the name is derived from ancient Greek words, krotos, which, is a, which means rattling noise or beat of the feet in dancing, and kruma, which means a beat or stroke put together. Those words are krumata, which is thought to be the ancient Greek word to refer to percussion instruments. Um, the current members, here we go with more Swedish names, are Roger Bergstrom, Pontus Lagendorf, Ulrich Nilsson, and Johan Silvmark. I'm sorry to any Swedes out there that I've just offended. Um, They were a state-funded ensemble for very many years um, until 2008. Now they are independently run. Over the years, they've premiered over 220 works by a lot of notable composers, um, some of which were, I would say a large portion of which were Swedish, but also some kind of more international names, um, including Sofia Gubaidalina, Janis Zanakis, Askel Masson, and Per Norgard. Their repertoire also includes works by familiar names like Steve Reich, John Cage, and Toru Takamitsu. Um, they've had quite a few notable performances, including um, a lot of Swedish cultural events. They're kind of a, a favorite of the King of Sweden. So they performed at the 50th birthday of King Carl XVI Gustav of Sweden, they performed at uh, Stockholm's 750th anniversary and at the 20th year Jubilee concert for the Royal Couple of Sweden, not of Britain. Um, they've performed at several PASICs, including 1984 in Ann Arbor, 1988 in San Antonio with Keiko Abe, 1995 in Phoenix, 2003 in Louisville for their 20th year anniversary, 2008 in Austin for their 30-year anniversary. They've wow. had several concerto written for them, uh, several concerti written for them as a group as well, including a piece called Tides by Rolf Wallen, um, which is for six percussionists and orchestra, which they premiered with the Swedish Radio Symphony Orchestra under Esapeka Salonen. And um, Georg Katzer, German composer's concerto for Krumata and orchestra with the Berlin Symphony Orchestra, which I had to remind myself that's not the same thing as the Berlin Phil. Um, and they've collaborated with a lot of artists throughout the years, including Keiko Abe, who I mentioned before with that PASIC performance. Uh, I, I know this trumpet player's name, but pronouncing it, it still trips me up. It's Haken Hardenberger um, and the trombonist C- Christian Lindbergh. Um, they've recorded over 20 CDs. In 1983, they made the first digitally recorded uh, CD produced in Sweden, um, they have two CDs with Keiko Abe, which I have to say, on a personal note, has my favorite recording of Marimba Spiritual. And they performed with Nexus in 2000. So that is, in a nutshell, the Krumata Percussion Ensemble. 
So just to let you guys know how big they are in Sweden, um, Google Absolute Kromat, which is the SNL of of Sweden, did a parody of Kromata. Yeah, so I saw that. that. It's hysterical. Oh, cool. Yeah. <laughs> Did you get yeah, to work with them at all, Maria, or meet them? Or? I met them. I actually, Anders Ostrin's studio was in their building, so oh. I talked to them quite often, and I did a lot of um, shows at their space. So they have this amazing space in in Stockholm that it's just all their gear, and it's a performance space, um, and seen. with some practice studios in the back and a nice like atrium. So it's actually a big inspiration for me to see this like hub of percussion in the city, um, trying to. I've, it's definitely been very inspiring to kind of bring back and say, wouldn't that be great? Um, and, yeah. yeah. Maria, I have a question about that. Sure. I, when I was reading about their current members, their former members, all these people that had played with the group, I thought that Anders was, had played with the group at some point, but I didn't see him listed on anything. But then I thought that maybe he was just kind of a sub for the group. Did he, did he ever play with Kramata? He didn't. Officially, he's played with them, yeah, as like a sub or a guest soloist. Um, his genre is a little bit more towards exper experimental jazz and improvisation. So, um, yeah, it's a little bit of a different um, sound and what he's kind of going okay. for. But, um, you know, he's played with them in the past. And yeah, I know. They have a lot of new members that are really great, and they're trying to kind of uh, re-energize the, the, the name and... Perform and perform yeah. more. I think when they lost their state funding, so this is an interesting like um, difference in kind of economies. They were state funded forever, and then ha now have to fundraise on their own. Where we're over here used to just state funding. What's that? So right. um, yeah. I was there when they were trying to figure that out, um, which is you know a challenge. Yeah, you know? I, I I remember in 2008 when that happened. Like basically, I was told like this group is done, like they're gone, and so I was. I was pleased that they were able to kind of stick around after that. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. There are, though, aren't there options for, if, you, if say, you are a percussion trio, quartet, quintet, or, or something, as long as you are doing a certain amount of public service, like you're going to do X amount of, like, school assemblies a year, you're going to provide this, that, and that, you can get, like, really good pretty good support, right? I think federal and... I think you could probably get some support in the in the United States, but I mean, this is a group that were basically hired by the government and paid like a, as far as I can mm -hmm. understand, a full-time salary. Um, exactly. No, I know. I, I know, I know. And, th and that is like this thing, and I think a lot of times we compare this huge thing to what we don't have here, but I think what a lot of people don't know is we do have these options for support. Yeah. They're just not like, you know... Yeah not like what what they have or like you know the 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 Jew percussion group I mean they're like really really right. you know the the high high of efficiency are involved you know yeah and it, I mean it's just so cool to me that like the the king of Sweden is like you know loves this contemporary music group um, because a lot of the time contemporary music groups are Shall we say on the fringes? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You said the you said the king of Sweden, and what popped into my head was that king on Game of Thrones, the king of the 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 White Walkers. Anybody? No, I I thought you were going to say King of Denmark, which is totally different. <laughs> oh no, dude, I'm not even. No. The king of Sweden. Yeah. Sweden. Hey, um, hey, Maria. Speaking of ensembles and and Sweden, what's Ensemble Evolution doing right now? I, last I heard you guys, you played at Pasic. Um, yeah. I think that was some time ago. So what have you guys been up to? Yeah, so we're kind of all doing our own thing these days and staying in touch and chatting about the possibility of getting together in the future. Um, Charles is in Australia getting a PhD in computer science and really integrating technology into his, his art practice. And we were able to get together last year to do a couple shows here in Boston, played some of his music um, that he wrote in Sweden. And Jake is composing and teaching down in Texas. We don't have the capacity to get together anytime really in the near future, but kind of stay in touch as inspiration for each other. And I mean, I still, um, the sounds, sounds from the tree tra Treetops project and CD, which was our last project, has kind of re, um, or has evolved into some other opportunities for me and I know for Charles and Jake as well so we're kind of um, just staying in touch at this point but don't have the capacity to get together um, trying to establish our 
grounded lives in different places at the moment. Yeah. Okay. Great. Can we, uh, can we talk about IKEA some more? <laughs> yeah. 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 Totally. They yeah, have the best I mean... metal bowls. They sound so good. Hello. Yeah. So, you know. how many of you guys have owned some of those seven dollar side tables? Anybody else own a few oh, yeah. of those? All right. <laughs> That's enough. <laughs> <laughs> Does this get edited, by the way? It gets edited. <laughs> We're here to educate. Yeah. Um, speaking of, Laurel, do you have something to educate us about? Or, uh, uh, or Megan, whoever wants to go next? Sure. What? <laughs> <laughs> go for it, Laurel. Yeah, you can't look. We learned this no, last you time. Can't. When you're talking, you can't look at the text thing because <laughs> people are trying to make other people laugh, and it works great as we learn. So, and they Laurel, say, just do your thing. Don't I'm worry sorry. about what Ben's typing. I gotta look this up. <laughs> you can. You it's can not real. Um, yeah. So, oh, so actually, can, sorry, can I make a can I make a correction to last week real quick? Yeah. Sorry, We're, I'm totally taking over this one. I'm sorry. La I just want to clarify something. Last week, uh, during my segment, I said that Ruth Stuber played the Creston concertino on a King George marimba, um, which was a different muster marimba orchestra. It was actually the Century of Progress marimba. And I only say that because I know Bill Mersh is going to watch it and call me out on it. <laughs> so that's why it's a Century of Progress marimba. Yeah, I've already gotten so many you know. emails about like yeah, yeah. people are just. I think there was a, a riot. Ben's mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think whenever we have Bill Morris on the show, we just need to play Jeopardy with him on percussion <laughs> trivia. Yeah, that's that's a great idea. Idea. percussion lit class feels. You find out how much you don't know about anything. <laughs> <laughs> we should incorporate games. We could do charades. Oh, we could. Oh man! I'm gonna, I'm gonna try Let's to just talk make about this him. Later. <laughs> I'll try to just make him mad. Tell him the Chavez was the first percussion ensemble piece ever written. And... Lee Stevens premiered Reflections on the Nature of Water in 1975. Right. Yeah, Nancy yeah. Zeltzman was the first marimbist ever to hold four mallets. <laughs> All right, Laurel, come on. All right, we're gonna really it. mess up some young kids. That's it. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Go, okay. So, um, for the last. For all the episodes, I've been kind of combining two different books that I've been reading, one of which is called Creativity, which is all about the psychology of a discovery invention, and the other is The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And so I realized this week when I was thinking about what do I want to talk about now, and Maria's here, um, I realized, wow, I guess I'm just trying to figure out what it means to be a an effective, creative person. <laughs> And what does that mean, and how do you do it, and um, all of those things. And so I've, I've been really thinking about it a lot. And it seems like to some degree to be either of those things, you know, there has to be some type of, like, acknowledgement by an audience or by society. And, you know, and for us it, it can be very small because I do get great joy out of playing, like, a small chamber concert. No, that's so great. But then there's something else when you do a big project like, like Maria, you've got something coming up where you're going to play on the Green Monster at Fenway Park, which like so many people know about, you right. know, and people know of the Green Monster. So this, this audience just expanded by like thousands, you know, and there's, there's kind of a different feeling that goes along with that. And so it reminded me of a TED Talk that I heard of, in 2013 that I actually never watched but I finally got around to watching and it's called The Art of Asking. So have any of you watched this talk? Mm -hmm. Amanda Palmer's, yeah. Yeah, Amanda yeah. Palmer. Um, yeah, and so for, for anybody listening that hasn't seen it, I'll make sure there's a link embedded in the YouTube description so that you can get to it. Um, but she ends her talk by wondering if we could let people pay for music instead of making them pay for music. And she's coming at it from more of a popular genre kind of thing than perhaps our more immediate projects are in the terms of trying to put on a performance or start it on profit or begin an ensemble. Um, but I do think that 
at the heart of it, it's still very much the same. Um, and what really struck me as I was watching this is that she doesn't talk about how to ask people. Like you would, she doesn't say, this is how you get people to trust you and how you get people to like you. Um, all she talks about is the beauty of a true connection with another person and an acknowledgement of each other's existence um, in a way that only another person can do. Not even a full audience, not even a you know, larger society type um, organism, but just one person. And that when you do that, something happens and you kind of realize that you want to help one another. And um, that got me thinking because as uh, this might be just me or it might be you guys too, I don't know. And, and she talked about this just a little bit in the talk that she's met artists that are afraid to ask anything. If it's, can I play in your space? Or once you're there playing, like, to pass the hat, like, people do, you know, you have like a dollar or something, and that there's something inside of you that goes like, I can't do that. No, I can't do that. Um, uh, or like, that's not fair, because there's a, I don't, I would assume you guys feel this, but there's something inside that, that just says, I want to share what I do, and I'd love to get paid for it, but it's more important to share it, so I will. <laughs> um, and she had this really just interesting point of view about it, that it's totally fair because when you share something, like, you know, our gifts as musicians, somebody gets something from it. And it's only natural for there to be some type of exchange, even if it's not monetary, you know, and chances are it might not be, but um, that it is totally fair and that it, it isn't wrong uh, and that it's actually incredibly beautiful in terms of how people can connect with one another. And it's actually really meaningful for it, too. Um, and I, I thought, like, that kind of attitude, how there has to be no ego there, you know, because being afraid to ask for things, whether it's, you know, a collaboration or someone to host something or you propose something and say, oh, and here is my fee. There is a fee. Um, you know, being brave enough to do that, you're brave enough to accept that you could get rejected. Um, or that they'll say no, and then you wonder, well, if, if I said I'd do it for free, would they have accepted it? You know, and that's this whole other thing. And I got to thinking that, you know, we are artistic people, but that doesn't make us super special people. We're just normal people like everybody else. And um, taking in what she said about the fairness of the exchange, like we're just like everyone else contributing to society and the way that we do um, and what we have to offer is just as valid but it's not more valid either. You know, there's kind of this equal fairness. And so um, something I wanted to talk to you about, Maria, mm -hmm. um, you know, you moved to a new city and then you had to build this network like you were talking about. and um, did you experience any type of nervousness about having to ask people to play or venues to accept you? And can you just talk about that a little bit? Sure. I think you hit on so many good points that we could um, kind of go down a wormhole, but um, I hope we can continue this dialogue about collaboration and about um, how you interact with your audience, interact with other people, and how you kind of create a community around your practice and your art. I think it's a really important topic, but it was um, it was definitely intimidating coming to a brand new city. I didn't study here. I have no family here. Um, I did have the foundation of a job, which was wonderful, and I'm very thankful for that. Um, and I think what I dedicated my first like six months to 12 months was just going to shows. I wanted to see who was doing stuff. Like, what is this scene like? What, you know, there's all these, there's like 60 institutions in Boston. It's a very academic city. So, like, what, what do each of these academia uh, scenes, what do they put out? What are the freelance, what are the freelancers doing? What, you know, what's happening? And 
um, I always went and I would like look at the programs, I would see the people, and I'd always try my best to interact with those people in some way. Go, hey, that was really great playing, like here's who I am. That doesn't matter, but you know, you did great. I really enjoyed what you brought into this world. Thank you. And try to just genuinely be interested in what was going on here because there's there's amazing things happening around you and the way to kind of build that network is just to meet those people face to face. Um, it did take a while for me to kind of find my footing like you know I'm used to playing in an ensemble now I'm one person what do I do? Do I like try to create a solo show? Do I try to do this? And I think um, organically just I took a lot of people to coffee I took, we had lots of lunches, lots of beers and just you know if you need someone let me know and some people started to say oh yeah come and try this do this and um, then I started to get a little braver and saying okay I know these venues exist what if I went and did something here and um, I think I part of my personality is a bit of fearlessness like and um, one of the the biggest things I've actually taken away from my job at NEC is the the definition of being an entrepreneur and that is taking full risk in every endeavor and I believe as artists we take full risks every day. We play a note, we're taking a risk by projecting art and music into the world, we call a venue, we state our fee no matter what, you state your fee and if they accept it that's great, if they reject it, great, you know, you try to do these collaborations and I've definitely, definitely been rejected in the city multiple times, for sure. But, you know, I, I think the confidence to say, well, that's just not the right partnership or that's just not the right venue, this right host, the right, you know, environment, and to kind of move on to the next is um, healthy and it's hard and it's definitely, like, not as easy as I just try to make it sound. <laughs> but um, I think, you know, again, this word, like, community and collaboration is really important to me, and I think it's wh why projects get off the ground. It's because it's not just one ensemble or one producer or one artist. It's a lot of people coming together to make something happen. And the art audience is a part of that, right? So they're as much a part of the experience as the creators themselves. So I love that Amanda talks about the, the beauty of the ask and inviting people in. So when you create a program or you create a project that you're really taking them into account, Account, and you're actually leaving yourself behind like okay I have this voice and I like this music and I want to project this music and play it but in what environment and in what way and in what program order will actually invite the audience into that experience and leave them inspired and leave them with some sort of um, experience that they won't forget I don't know yeah. if that answered your question at all I think and I'll I'll kind of play the bad guy for for just a moment. But I think a lot of people are afraid to do to ask because it's hard to advertise, and we nobody likes advertisements. Um, so it's probably, and I know I don't, and this is where I'll be the bad guy. But I know nobody likes advertisements, and I hate it when I get an email that says greetings from so and so percussionist, and I think they're saying hi because it says greetings. It's not a greeting. It's right. an advertisement. They email you and they give you this long thing and it it sucks you in by acting like it's a personal message and then it turns out they're telling you about their fee and they're trying to get themselves invited to your whatever. Mm -hmm. And like that that pisses people off, you know, totally. like and so I think, you know, um you have to do it in in the in the right way, I guess. Um Absolutely. and you know, I don't know, Maria, what is the yeah. right way to do that? Totally. So what you just described is the wrong way. It really right. is. Right. Yeah, right. totally. Yeah. That's not what I'm, yeah. So you're not the bad guy, you're the smart guy. And, um, yeah, well, I think... Like, okay, sorry, sorry, real quick, one more thing. Yeah. I, I wrote a Facebook post once, and I said, am I, am I right in thinking that when you post your advertisements for your stuff on, like, other people's Facebook walls, oh. it's, like, annoying and makes people mad? And, like, everyone was like, oh, yeah, it's so bad. I unfriend those people and, and, and all this stuff. So, so anyway, d d tell us the right way. Yeah. So I think um, it's about that personal. It's about that one-on-one. -on -one, and um, I use, we use the word and when I teach the word wooing a lot. And it's not meant to be, like... Um, uh, malicious in any way, but I, like I want to work with Megan because I like Megan, right? Like I want to work with 
I would work with any of you. We would all work together because essentially deep down we just like each other and you want to work with people you like. Um, I think when you write what we call a cold email like that, there's no personal connection behind it. So maybe if that person would call you and say, hey Casey, you know, like, you know, here's who I am. I see you have a show coming up. I'd really love to learn more about that. Can you tell me about you? Can you tell me about your new job? Can you tell me about, you know, something and if they would cultivate that relationship first maybe continue like conversing about something that's in common and then say hey I do have this project would you be interested um, that's that's how it's done you have to create a relationship first whether that's with a collaborator or with an audience member and so advertising is creating that relationship with the audience member before the show and you know these kind of personal phone calls, these going out to coffee and kind of being within the community is cultivating the relationship with those collaborators before making the ask. I mean, um, I definitely did a lot of things wrong, especially you know you just have to figure out what feels good and feels wrong. You know, like you email a museum and you email the curator and you're like, oh, I have this big thing, I'm so excited, oh my gosh, blah, 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 blah. and you don't hear anything and you're like, okay, that was the wrong way. You know, you just kind of, yeah. you figure it, you figure it out. You have to try. Like, you know, we could, um, we could teach these things and we could say these things, but people just have to try it out. So when people email me and it's kind of, it feels a little wrong, I just say they're learning. And yeah. You know, another couple of years maybe that I'll we'll cross paths again because I want to forgive that because especially if they're a little younger. Um, but I mean, even the most fruitful relationships, like if you would have like accepted that person as like coming and doing something, it might not have even been a great experience because that like foundation of a relationship wasn't there. So you also have to think about that, like the most successful production or concert or workshop or visit will happen when there's there's a relationship that's been cultivated. Well, mm -hmm. and I think, you know, probably a, a real important thing in that cultivation process and getting to know them is probably just knowing if they have room and desire right. to collaborate on like a new mm -hmm. thing because I've had people reach out that just say, hey, let's get something going. Let's collaborate on something. And yeah. I say, okay, well, well, what are you thinking? And they go, I don't know anything. <laughs> I'm supposed to be networking. I just, I need to network. <laughs> I need to network. Let's network. Let's, like, do yeah. stuff. And it's like, well, wait, do what? That doesn't sound exciting at all. Like, do right. something? What? You know? And right. it's like, dude, I have, pl I have this many projects already. No, <laughs> I, I'm not interested in making new ones. And they need to feel the person out before they, like, annoy them, you know, and that, so I mean it's it makes perfect sense that you would want to like do that first so I, yeah, I think it's real quick, yeah, one thing, great. One thing, I, I get those same emails that Casey talks about where it's like, you know, dear sir or madam, like I'm <laughs> interested in coming to your school yeah. and it's like as as someone that, that works here, I, I know my students very well, if there's someone that I think will benefit my students I will bring them in. Like I brought Anders here a couple of years ago because I, I knew my students, I knew my strengths as a teacher, I knew what Anders did, and I wanted to bring him in. So when you send out a generic email where you're just maybe changing out the names on the email and basically sending the same thing, it becomes very like impersonal and I don't want someone that's going to do their generic workshop for my students because my students and, you know, Jim Campbell's students have entirely different needs and if you do the same workshop for his students that you do for my students my students probably aren't going to get the same things out of it that you intended you know or you know vice versa I think that anyone I bring here I would want to be tailored to um, my students so to speak yeah. I took a picture of you I'm sorry Ben <laughs> I know that was really distressing <laughs> It was an accident. It's awesome. <laughs> well, um, Megan, do you have a segment this week? I do. Yeah, so um, thinking of Maria, I think about these projects that she does, and I recently came across a viral video of a 1,000 musicians in Italy playing a Foo Fighters song, covering a Foo Fighters song, Learn to Fly, and basically asking them to do a show. And when I when I was thinking about what I wanted to present on today, and 
Um, I was thinking of Maria. I was like, if there's one person who could do something like this, it would be Maria. <laughs> so I thought I would just explain this project a little bit. First of all, have any of you guys seen this? Yeah! Yeah, it went viral like, over the past month, I guess. It came out on July 30th. And it's um, the organizer's name is Fabio Zafagnini. And he's really started organizing this project over a year ago because he wanted to see the Foo Fighters live um, near his hometown of Cesena, Italy, which is a small town of 100,000 people in the northeast part of Italy. And the project was just to make a grand statement, and he wanted to assemble a cover band of 1,000 Italian musicians performing Learn to Fly, and he wanted the instrumentation to be 350 guitarists, 250 singers, 250 drummers. Huh. 150 bases. And so what he did is he solicited uh, audition videos to be a part of this cover band. And he named the band The Rockin' 1000. And he had such a great response that he had to sift through thousands of audition videos. And this is not like, you know, if you win, you get an all expenses paid trip to Zena to perform for the Foo Fighters. It was like, we don't know what this is. I just have this crazy idea and I don't have any money to give you. But if you're interested, you know, I'm going to organize this and it's going to be awesome. You should be a part of it. I can imagine getting that email from Maria. <laughs> <laughs> and so he had such a great response uh, that he sifted through thousands of videos, selected his 1,000 Italian musician cover band. And uh, he did a, a crowdfunding campaign also and raised about $50,000 for recording funds. He had a professionally recorded video, audio, um, he had scaffolding so that a conductor could kind of be up, he had microphones and, and everything. And these musicians came from all over Italy, um, on nationwide, on their own money. And the message is, so they performed, they performed in sync together, you know, this the song. They performed the Foo Fighters together. Not yeah. Yeah, Ben, Good that's what I heard too. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Definitely a Foo Fighters song, not an cover song. And <laughs> at the end, um, Fabio said, stated his message, which was, Italy is a country where dreams cannot easily come true, but it's a land of passion and creativity. And what we did here is just a huge, huge miracle. And our call is to ask you, the Foo Fighters, to come and play for us, to come and play here, to give a concert to all of us in Sizzling. And then they all cheered really loudly for a couple of minutes and, you know, showed, showed their support for the Foo Fighters. So they put the video on YouTube and it received over 15 million hits in three days. And now if you look it up on YouTube, we'll put a link in, the, in, the, in our YouTube video, but it has over 24 million hits. And um, so Dave Grohl, who we know is the founder and frontman of the Foo Fighters and the former drummer from Nirvana, was so moved by this, he called this, this video beautiful and he responded quickly in Italian, actually. He, he speaks a little bit of Italian and said, translated to English, that we're coming, I swear we will see each other soon in his message back to these 1,000 musicians. Wow. So, and shortly after the video was released, the Foo Fighters announced their tour dates, and we don't know if this was planned already, but there are two tour dates in Italy, and one is four hours away in Turin uh, from Cesena, and another one is in uh, Casaleccio de Reno, and that's an hour from Cesena. So they will definitely be able to attend their show. That's awesome. And I was looking at some of the YouTube comments in the video, and one of the, one of the comments was from one of the participating drummers, and he said, Hello, Foo Fighters. I'm one of the drummers who participated in Rockin' 1000. For me, it was the most extraordinary musical experience I've ever had, especially for the simple fact that I was part of an event that in less than half a day has gone around the world broadcasting the most important message that only music can do. The music makes us free and brings us together with a priceless magic. So I just thought that was such a cool message. You know, he went on to say how Dave Grohl was such an inspiration um, to him when he was growing up and learning how to drum. Um, but yeah, I just thought that the video was so well produced, and you guys should check it out. We'll put a link to it as well. Yeah, I've, I've not I've not seen it, um, but but exciting, and it makes perfect sense. Yeah. Of course, they're going to go there. Of course, that's like so Foo Fighter 
style mm-hmm. to go, you know, be re- you know, to, to receive that and appreciate it and respond to it like I'm sure they would. It's a really right. cool example. You know, our, p- people in our field ask all the time, like, like, what do I have to do? How do I, how do I like make it or whatever? And and I think that's actually a really good example, like how you make something happen. You need to do something different. You know, mm-hmm. that it's like we we look at these people who've like made it and achieved the thing that we want to achieve, and then you go try to do that same thing and it doesn't work. It's like, well, when they did it, it was original. And it's like these dudes put on this crazy, cool idea that hasn't been done before and sounds like yeah. they got what they wanted. It's like, and I think it's so easy for a lot of people to be cynical about it and say, well, how, you know, even with the 250 drummers, you know, how are you going to load in the gear? How are you going to have 250 drummers stay in time together? How are the, is everybody going to be doing the same fill or a different fill? You know, there are so many different variables. And I think from the presenter or the organizer's standpoint, you know, just being really organized about everything and really keeping that positive attitude of, like, we can do this. Of course, there are going to be obstacles and there are things that we're going to have to figure out that might seem impossible, but, like, we can do this. We're going to make this happen. And I think that that... Um, just that attitude is also makes other people excited about projects like this. You know, Easy. I have an idea for a piece. Oh the crap! Number one thousand for one thousand. <laughs> 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 but this piece, oh, this also this product also reminds me of a next to it, which we were talking about a couple weeks ago with Sean. You know, yeah. and that nobody gets paid for that. Some people drive all the way across the country to do this for free. You know. There, it's just interesting with these musical projects, these mass projects, um, people yeah, have, will lose money have on. You guys, have you read the uh, the Steve Schick book, the same de- what is it, same bed, different same dreams? Bed, different dreams, yeah. And he talks about uh, Steve Reich's drumming in there, and he talks about how like it's it's not necessarily a piece to be listened to like a Beethoven symphony. It's a piece to experience. Um, and he he talks about that kind of community aspect of playing. I think it's like the last sentence of the book, spoiler alert, is something like, you know, and so we end together or something like that. Yeah, there's definitely that community aspect to it. Yeah. And just, I guess, Maria, maybe just to, to touch on one of your projects, can you tell us maybe about this Green Monster project that you have coming up and how you've gone about organizing it and what it can is? You tell us what the Green Monster is because I have no idea. You have no um, idea. Yeah. All right. So. Sorry. <laughs> Come on. Um, actually, it's it's. I'm probably going to totally mess up what it is, but it's actually the scoreboard of Fenway Park. So our whole left field is a green wall, and it's, you know, Fenway Park is one of the oldest, it's probably, is it the oldest? I don't know. It's a very old baseball field. <laughs> and uh, the, the green monster is a scoreboard, and, like, a person comes out and, like, changes the numbers, and it's very... Um, important in like sport folklore and those kinds of things and um, we are going to be playing on the back side of it so in the field it's the scoreboard behind it it's this beautiful metal structure it's just the the beams that kind of hold it up and speaking of kind of um, getting a phone call or having a crazy idea I got the phone call from a director of this festival Illuminous that I worked for in the past and collaborated with and he said we have access to the green monster. Let's do something. And you just wow. say yes. You know, you don't, you don't like say, oh, but how? And how are, you know, like, what is it going to sound like? Or what would you like us to do? You just say, okay, let's do it. Let's figure it out. And um, I got the phone call in June, and the festival's in October. So it's been crazy. But what we're doing, um, we ideated a lot. We got together. All right, we have, we have these things to work with. We have a permit to the street. We have access to the structure, which is about three, four stories tall. Um, and we have a lot of creative people in the city. And we landed on this idea of waking the monster through art. And um, what we've done, I've partnered, I've brought on another percussionist because it was just too much for one mind to kind of go forth and do everything and logistically and creatively the more the better so my friend Ryan Edwards and I are kind of co-producing it um, and my the, the task I gave myself was to map the structure as a musical instrument so we've gone to multiple site visits we've played we have found the tones we've recorded the tones and then created a notation system for nine percussionists to 
kind of have different stations, which in our world, that's like, wow. yeah, that's what you do. It's a multiple percussion setup, done. But communicating that to visual artists, to projection artists, to dancers, to all of our different collaborators is like, they find that very inspiring in, in some way or just fascinating. So um, that's been kind of a fun conversation to, to explain what notation looks like, to how, how musicians communicate from one to another. And with that system, we've done a call for scores. So we're going to premiere six pieces, one by me, my friend Ryan, and then four composers that won the call, Nate Tucker, Bo Kenyon, Kirsten Volness, and um, Sean Kayab. Kayab? Not really sure. Are these all Boston people, or this was nationwide or international? So we, we did prioritize New England based, so they're from this area. Um, we did open it because we wanted to kind of see what we got, but it was like a week call. It was like, you have seven days, you have this notation system, you have these sounds, like give us 30 seconds of what you got. And wow. we got 12 scores um, or recordings. We let them either put into Pro Tools to give us an, a, a live kind of sound of what they wanted. Um, and we chose we chose four out of the twelve, which was really exciting and really we wanted to do all of them, but um, it's going to be really intense anyway to put this together. Yeah. And we're kind of troubleshooting as we go. We're going to have in your um, in your monitors. Um, there's going to be sound responsive triggers on eight spots on the monster, which will trigger projection art. So there will be kind of mapped light on us, there will be light design, and we'll actually be able to change some of the visuals as it goes, in addition to a projection artist live um, kind of um, tweaking things live as we go. So That's we can pretty much map anything, any sort of graphic, any sort of picture onto us, but we'll be able to manipulate it as will the projection artist. It's like, phew, it's wild, but it's super exciting. And you know, I saw a couple of your short uh, preview videos of yeah. you guys testing out the sounds. Are you guys going to be in harnesses, or how do you... Yeah. <laughs> so that's like a troubleshooting thing, right? We like, they're like, we're going to play on it, and then we just go, and we're like, okay, well, we can't reach the second level, but a ladder will get us on to the second level. We had some cross beams, so we have a tech engineer that's going to create a stage in the second, what we're calling the second tier, so it's like three boxes on the bottom, that's like a story, and then the second level has some cross beams you can stand on, but the third story is really hard to get to, but has some amazing sounds, because it just has these like really thin metal structures that the bottom doesn't have, so we really want to get people up there. So, I mean, and I'm like, I'm not, you know, didn't climb many trees when I was a kid, but heights, sure, let's do it. So they put me in a harness, got a bucket truck, and you know I'm five two, so the bucket like I was in the truck in the bucket, and it was like up to here. And then they lifted me up to the top part, and they had created um, put some wiring in. They they kind of rigged it up to have a safety um, rigging, kind of a safety rope. And so I harnessed into the safety rope. They're like, okay, go ahead. Oh my I'm like trying to climb out of this bucket and trying to like grab onto the beam that is covered in soot and bird poop because no one's been up there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like sticks in my back pocket and I'm like foot. climbing onto the beam. You know, things they don't teach in grad school. But um but it was awesome. And you just like say heights, whatever. You got this is the job, this is the gig, and we explored yeah. the top. And so it'll be myself and two other percussionists will be in harnesses because it is so high up and there's not we will be standing like on one beam playing up here um for you know, four hours, but sure. And, um, yeah, it's, it's again, it's like one week, okay, here are the problems we need to solve. How are we going to solve them? Got got it. Next. Go. So we're a month yeah. out. If it's a month out, we're just like, we're really starting to hit our stride, and it's a really fun team. So, yeah. That's so, awesome. So, oh, go ahead, Casey. Oh, you know, I saw this question uh, from, from Chris Brophy, who thanks, thanks, Chris, for another great question. You've given us good questions before, but it, it pertains to something this elaborate, I think. Chris says, Maria has done a fantastic job putting together unconventional ensembles and creating new ideas slash pieces for years now. Thank you for your contributions. Okay. What advice do you have in terms of funding? Uh, ah. Is most of your work done through grants and proposals to universities, crowdfunding, or other methods? Mm. Such a great question. Um, and the answer is it's varied. 
very much through project to project. And this particular project is funded through the festival and through it's hosted by something called Hub Week, which is um, this week in Boston that is dedicated to the collision of art, technology, and science. So they're hosting us, and they kind of called me. So what's awesome is eventually when you kind of do enough projects, you put yourself out there, maybe for free, you just do something because you have the vision, you kind of turn a path where then people say, oh, you know, I've seen that you've played music under tree houses. Maybe you could come and play on the Green Monster. So that's kind of an exciting turn in your career. But that happens, like, you know, every once in a while. Um, <laughs> so I've, I've definitely done a lot of grant writing. Um, I've gotten some funding through the city of Boston. So they look in your, um, look, your municipality, often have um, arts grants, and, you know, in Boston, there's Boston, there's Cambridge, there's Somerville, there's a lot of different communities. And as long as you're serving um, inhabitants of that community, you can do a project, say, in a suburb outside of Boston, but you can still apply for another municipality if it's going to be serving that community. Um, when I was overseas in Sweden, I, I did apply through the university a lot, which was really great. And um, I have done some crowdfunding, which is exhausting. Crowdfunding is um, a job in itself, and a lot of people always say, oh, we'll just crowdfund. Oh, we'll just, sure, we'll just raise some money. That's easy. We'll do that Kickstarter thing. But um, it's definitely worth it, but it's, it's definitely, I learned a lot from that experience that it takes a lot of time, a lot of energy, a lot of asking, and asking in a humble way, in a way that feels genuine to oh, not only yourself, but the person receiving that ask. Um, and I think the biggest part, the biggest um, kind of takeaway from thinking about funding for the arts is that you have to have multiple avenues. So that is grant looking at grant funding, that is looking at the institutions in which you're a part of, that is looking at crowdsourcing, cultivating individual donors. It's not one path that will get you like the next 10 years of your life ready to go, but it's kind of looking at how can you have as many multiple streams of um, income and funding as possible. That's that's really great, and actually that answered another question by Kellen Smith, which was, how about any tips slash advice for starting and performing ensembles outside of a university setting? So I think that answers that really yeah. well. Yeah. Uh, Megan, so, I think you have a question. Yeah, yeah I was just going to say, with Facebook. all these projects, Maria, and pe you know, people can learn more about these other projects on your website, I think, too. Mm -hmm. You have a great website. Mm -hmm. um, but... How do you, like, time management? So there's a, one more question from Facebook from Stephen Keener um, that says, could you please ask Miss Finkelmeyer where she, when she finds the time to sleep or eat in between all of the projects, jobs, and outreach initiatives that fill her schedule? So maybe you could give us some advice. Well, it's, um, <laughs> it's tough, and I think everyone uh, speaking today would have, you know, it's a challenge we probably all you know, but up against is that where's the time? Our brains are constantly thinking of new things and we're like having new projects and we have lessons to teach and we have this job to go to and you know, I really want to make this dinner, um, have a personal life in some way and sleeping and working out and how do we kind of balance it all? I think when you accept that thinking about your schedule and being very um, thoughtful about how you spend your time, when you accept that that is a priority, I think that's when you kind of can get a handle on it. When you yeah. look at every Sunday and say, okay, what does the week have? Um, and I, I try to never say, I'm too busy. Or if someone asks me how I am, I try not to say, oh, I'm so busy. Because to me, that, that is apologizing for it. And um, when things are worth doing, you'll find the energy to do it. Um, yeah. I mean... With, with that said, I've def it's, it's kind of a trial and error thing again, you know? Like you, you try, you email somebody, you try to use this language, it might not work. You know, maybe I try to split up my day in one way and it doesn't work. Um, you just have to kind of go through those motions and see what works for you. But um, having a great support system around you, people to talk about things with, um, all kind of help me figure my schedule out. And also um, constantly asking yourself, does this make me happy? And a lot of times we'll say yes to a gig or yes to a project or yes to something that doesn't necessarily make you happy. And what you need to do is just not say yes next time. Yeah. Um, and that, I mean, like I've gone through weeks in which I've just said, wow, 
I cannot do that again. And how can I um, document this feeling and this exhaustion to make sure it doesn't happen again? And I've gotten a little bit better with time, and I'm you know, going through a career shift soon that will um, help me um, better manage my schedule. But there's, you just kind of have to um, make sure you're doing really what makes you happy, because then you will have the energy to do it all. Yeah. As long as it makes you, as long as you really want to do it, you can get it done. It's just when something is bogging you down that you're not extremely excited or passionate about, and you have to figure out how to get that kind of out of your life. Right. I saw a, 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 a some quote in Percussive um, just a, a couple of weeks ago or a week ago. So, are you you're on a PASIC panel for entrepreneurship or something? Yeah. To so I um, I wrote some materials for an article. I'm not going to be attending PASIC this year, so I um, won't be on the panel, although I really appreciated the invitation. Um, but I, you cut out when you said the quote. Oh, I don't have the quote. Oh, okay. <laughs> what did I say? I don't remember. <laughs> okay. There was something along the lines that you were just talking about, about yeah. really making choices about... Uh, the projects that you believe in and, mm -hmm. and the projects that make you excited about, you know, yeah. and choosing to do those and saying no to other things. Right. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And I think I, pro I did speak to that a little bit in the article that will come out um, in Progressive Notes pre basic and yeah it's and it's trial and error I can't you know we all you just have to make mistakes um, we I call them successful failures mm -hmm. just, if you learn from it you can do better next time yeah. so hey awesome. Maria thanks thanks so much for joining us you know I, it seems like every guest, almost every guest we've had, I think more than not, someone asks a question about how do you find the time, how do you do this, how do you get all this stuff done, because uh, I feel like we've, we've talked about this several times, and I guess the thing I keep learning is like, yeah, it's not, it's just, it's not easy. <laughs> it's, it's all right, you know. Have um, you heard the uh, Leonard Bernstein quote? Oh, on, like, on time, uh, sorry, I'm like trying to... Scream. Okay, he, Leonard Bernstein said, to achieve great things, two things are needed, a plan and not quite enough time. That's right. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, that's good. Yep. Yeah. Um, I, I have to say, I, you know, I tell students sometimes, like, I haven't felt boredom in a decade, like, literally. Um, and I remember being a kid and being feeling boredom, but I, I personally don't. Um, I just have... I remember what it feels like, but I haven't felt it. And when I do have free time, I'm like so excited to do that thing I like to do or watch that thing I want to watch. Um, I, so I don't know. I imagine Maria probably the same. Oh, totally. I think um, what I've also realized is I have to kind of organize my free time a little bit. So I'm like, okay, if I have that day off, I'm going to do this thing. And I have to think about that. Because if I wake up and I'm like, what do I do today? You kind of get this like feeling of, of darkness because there's like not a goal to achieve that day. So uh, I really try to like, if I have free time, I'm like I'd love to reconnect with this person or do this thing. Um, so boredom is not a problem in this house, in this bright yellow room. And I, I do think that uh, it is important to say that it, it, it's imp it's important to do something other than just music. Like oh, I yeah. love it, I, you know, I practice of course all the time and all that sort of stuff. But at some point, you need to have friends. Like, you need to go out to a nice dinner, or you need to go to, you know, a park for a day or something, you know, just yeah. to enjoy life a bit. Totally. Yeah. Well, totally. And, and, like, uh, socially, you got to learn how to do that. Uh, like, I, I, you know, I've met people who haven't had a normal job, and they can't do their fancy job because they don't know how to talk to people. They don't know how to deal with difficult people. It's like, dude, mm -hmm. go be a waiter, like, for yeah. a, a year. Yeah. For, I think that, I think... Spet told me, I think, like, at, at Yale, he said they would get together on Friday nights and they would have, like, movie night, and they would say, like, we can't talk about music. We have to talk <laughs> about other things. And it's funny being in a room of musicians and trying to do that. What what did, what did normal people talk about? It's like... <laughs> Words. Words. They know what the green monster is. Sorry. That, you know. <laughs> I learned something hey, today. Maria, thanks so much for joining us. You guys, thanks so much for your segments. Always super good. And um, I think that's it. So next week we have Ian Rosenbaum, uh, nice. some, some guests coming up later, Eric Gunnivan, composer here at JMU, Sean Tilburg, 
principal percussion at uh, Arizona Symphony. Uh, Bill Schaltis, timpanist, coming up. And uh, we also have my dad booked, actually, because he's a mathematician and he has done a lot of research on some of these creativity topics. So anyway, the next couple of weeks are slated and exciting. And Your dad uh, has also go. seen the Book of Mormon. I know, I know. Yes, <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> Maria, they think this thing is still funny. That's not. But I'm, I'm, I'm like a, it's funny! I said something stupid once, like, to try to make small once? talk on the podcast, and they're all just like, Casey, yeah. Casey. So anyway. <laughs> you guys. Thank you. Yeah. Guys. Thank you so much. yeah. Bye! <laughs> you want me to click away now? All right, we'll click. Yeah, I'll just hit this button, and it'll all be over. <laughs>